All right, today we're going to look at uh, some of the further writings of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, William Wordsworth's great contemporary, his friend, and his, uh, uh, along with uh, Wordsworth, certainly one of the uh, leading figures of uh, Romanticism. And uh, with that, a figure that we must certainly attend to if we're going to consider the Romantic epic, uh, but also the reception of both Milton and the themes of the epic in the Romantic era. And what I'm going to submit to you today is that Coleridge, uh, although he has been seen by the critical tradition as the chief spokesman of the Romantic age and Romanticism in general, so if you look at the definitions of Romanticism, uh, the uh, chief hallmark of Romanticism tends to be uh, this watchword, the imagination, which we've already seen Wordsworth uh, places at key points in his own literary corpus. So for instance, when he ascends Mont Blanc uh, and uh, does not realize it and realizes that his imagination was greater than what he had anticipated uh, he would actually see in the experience of the sublime in the mountain uh, and gave this encomium to the imagination and then wrote upon it. That word imagination we will find in the writers that we are going to discuss on the course is repeatedly referenced. And of all the definitions of the imagination that come forth in the Romantic period, that of Coleridge, which we are going to look at today, is the most famous and often seen as the uh, definitive uh, romantic conception of the imagination. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to try and demonstrate that that is the case today, namely that the critical tradition has taken Coleridge's definition as the romantic definition and said therefore that his definition is one that includes and represents the period. I'll just simply assert it and you can find it for yourself elsewhere, but I'm not out on a limb here. Uh, nonetheless, it's my contention, and I've uh, made this clear in my own writing, such as uh, my book, Romanticism, Hermeneutics, and the Crisis of the Human Sciences, in the third chapter, that Coleridge's definition of the imagination, the imagination is different than his contemporaries, and indeed in some ways seems to be uh, steeled against it. And um, I'm going to try and demonstrate that, particularly with reference to the Biographia Literaria today, but I will also be including a variety of other works uh, that uh, we have seen are included in this work uh, by Wittreich, The Romantics on Milton. Um, so from, from a wide variety of, of writers, but I'm gonna take little extracts from Wittreich's case to present what I want to suggest to you today. And in that, I'm going to suggest that what we have in reflecting on the Romantic epic and the themes of the epic and Romanticism in general, we've already seen with Wordsworth, Romanticism is connected with uh, a sort of progress and an anti-religious progress at that. So the power of the mind reflecting on itself um, and uh, the feeling thought of imagination which Wordsworth presents so ably and so movingly in his poetry, which I nonetheless suggested was in some ways um, created as a uh, against the backdrop of Milton and as a move away from Milton, I think that we see in Coleridge's definition something that is uh, more in tune with the great tradition which Milton represents and to, some, to that extent breaks with the radical romantic revolt against tradition and the, the claim of an entirely new poetics uh, divorced from uh, the classical spirit and also in particular with Christianity. Uh, Coleridge, in other words, uh, presents a, a thoroughly Christian understanding of the imagination. And I think we can see this uh, even very early on in his work, but certainly we can see it in, fulsomely in the Biographia Literaria and in later works. Because I think, uh, and I agree with uh, uh, some scholars who suggest, like Wendling, who suggests that Coleridge makes 
uh, progress towards Christianity. And you'll recall what I said when I was discussing uh, Christabel, how it uh, was a phase when he was flirting with the idea of being a Unitarian minister and wrote this poem and fused the supernatural and the natural and in a syncretistic way, Christianity with, with paganism in his presentation in that poem. And that was only written <clears throat> uh, in the... Uh, around 1800. Nonetheless, in 1804, we can see in a letter to Richard Sharp, letter 535, if you're uh, consulting uh, Coleridge's notebooks or his letters, uh, he states this, Wordsworth is a poet, a most original poet. He no more resembles Milton than Milton resembles Shakespeare. No more resembles Shakespeare than Shakespeare resembles Milton. He is himself. And I dare affirm that he will hereafter be admitted as the first and greatest philosophical poet, the only man who has effected a complete and constant synthesis of thought and feeling and combined them with poetic forms, with the music of pleasurable passion and with imagination or the modifying power in that highest sense of the word in which I have ventured to oppose it to fancy, namely imagination and fancy, or the ag aggregating power in the sense in which it is a dim analog of creation. Not all that we can believe, but all that we can conceive of creation. So there we go. We already have here in his, uh, in his uh, letters to this man, Richard Sharp, uh, the delineation of two terms, um, that he will pick up in the Biographia Literaria, which he writes in 1817. I'll say more about the Biographia in a minute. Although I can refer you to a, a lecture uh, on uh, YouTube also that was specifically devoted to the Biographia and to nothing else, but that's not what I'm doing here today. Um, but these terms, and the terms are the fancy on the one hand and the imagination on the other hand, and uh, on the other hand, uh, a, a reference to the specific features of Wordsworth's genius, namely, he is a philosophical poet. And what, what Wordsworth, or rather Coleridge means by that is that he synthesizes thought and feeling and combines them with poetic forms. So feeling and thought, and that's why I said with when you're dealing with Wordsworth's notion of the imagination, we have to speak of the feeling thought of imagination. Nonetheless, um, uh, when we come to uh, the uh, fancy as opposed to the imagination, he refers to it as an aggregating power and, and specifically references an analog of creation. So all that we can conceive of creation is captured in this word, the fancy, and he juxtaposes it and contrasts it with the word imagination. Now we're going to see that this is written in 1804. By the time he comes to 1817, we, we note that he has still juxtaposed the fancy to the imagination, but he ascribes something, uh, he, he introduces another factor into this, namely a uh, another form of the imagination. So he'll refer to three uh, faculties at this point, the fancy, the primary imagination, and the secondary imagination. And he is going to similarly describe uh, the fancy as an aggregating power, and to some degree, but he will add to it by saying that it is dead insofar as it simply, uh, it, it, there's no activity of, of the mind in doing so. It just simply uh, records and acts in a way analogous to the creation but he does something very similar with the primary imagination to what he's doing in the fancy and nonetheless su suggests that it's a vital power. And then it's in the secondary imagination that something truly distinctive takes place. Now you might say, so what? what what's, what's the difference here? And why do we want to draw to, uh, why do I want to draw to your attention the fact that, that Coleridge does this unlike his contemporaries? Well, first of all, he is introducing uh, two imaginations as opposed to just one. And, and that, that's, that can't be disputed. Uh, secondly, why does he do so? 
and what's the effect of doing so? Uh, to my mind, to put it in a nutshell, and I'll, I'll make, uh, make this clear when we look at the biography in a second, uh, what he is doing there is to uh, contradistinguish his notion of imagination from that which uh, Coleridge, or rather Wordsworth, and we will find Shelley, Blake, uh, Keats, Byron, and his contemporaries are using. And with that, he will be tethering his notion, or at least his notion of the primary imagination, to something that is close to an, anal an analog of creation. And say, furthermore, that the secondary imagination cannot create except insofar as it repeat uh, what God has already created. So in Coleridge's secondary imagination, in other words, he is suggesting similar to what uh, J.R.R. Tolkien is suggesting when he speaks of the of sub-creation. So this creation, something that God does and that we uh, participate in insofar as we see his handiwork in that creation, and that's not just registering it in the way that we simply empirically uh, experience it. That would probably be something more like the fancy. It's an active power in which we see the unifying power behind what we experience with our senses. That's the primary imagination. But then the artist does something with those, uh, with that uh, God-like creative power and modifies it and creates a story analogous in some ways and in and reflecting on God's creative power. So it's a sub, it's a subordinate power while nonetheless suggesting that the artist not has a, a real creative capacity, but it's not limit, limitless and it's not, ab, um, uh, it's not original uh, in the, in the tot total sense. It doesn't begin ex nihilo. Whereas when you read the romantics claims for um, their own power of imagination, when I say the romantics, I mean uh, the writers aside from Coleridge, they're suggesting an originality which is basic, basically akin to God's. Um, and, and they demonstrate that by uh, creating narratives that are at odds not only with Milton's account, but are, are very much in sync with uh, pagan accounts. So they will reference uh, forces of chaos and darkness and disorder and anarchy, and these will be seen uh, as fundamentally creative insofar as they are disruptive and chaotic and disorderly uh, and isolated and so forth. Uh, Coleridge is not going to agree with that. And in fact, his definition of the imagination, I think, sharply distinguishes itself, is itself from that romantic conception. And so with that, there's something very curious about the whole uh, represent the whole rendering of Coleridge as the chief spokesman for romanticism because I think in his mature work he is an anti-romantic and more of a traditionalist but the critical tradition has yet to uh, agree with me on that I think they will because I think the evidence is there in the texts and Coleridge is most certainly seeing himself as a uh, Christian writer commenting on the broader uh, tradition of letters and seeing a unity um, underlying the work of the classical age, the Christian age, and his contemporary age. Whereas the Romantics in general want to suggest that there is a great revolutionary uh, poetics that is at work. In the case of Shelley, with the figure of the poet as a figure of revolution, as my former supervisor Timothy Clark presented it, the the poet himself is a figure of revolution, um, whereas, whereas Coleridge just wants to see more of a continuity there, while nonetheless seeing there's something unique about Mr. Wordsworth. And so, and we can see this already in this letter to Richard Sharp, um, that there is a uniqueness about Wordsworth, which uh, is, you can find similarly in Milton and similarly in Shakespeare. And then his task as a critic is to delineate for us, the reader, wherein precisely that uniqueness, uniqueness lies. But this, this uh, pairing of, of Milton on the one hand and Shakespeare on the other, he will continue to do, and he likes to uh, do these uh, antitheses in his thought, comparing great figures and wherein they're similar and wherein they're different, 
and we'll see in some of the extracts that I've given you, he does precisely that. But that this that this first letter, I think, is very interesting for that reason. Uh, let me move on to some of the other extracts that I asked you to have a look at. And for the sake of the audience that doesn't have the book in front of them, uh, I will read some uh, some lengthier pieces just so that you're aware of what I'm speaking to. So from his notebooks in 1810, Coleridge's notebooks uh, gathered here in Toronto uh, by Catherine, Kathleen Coburn years ago. Uh, Coleridge writes this, uh, what then shall we say? Even this, Shakespeare, no mere child of nature, no automaton of genius, possessed by the muse, not possessing. First, studied, deeply meditated, understood minutely, though knowledge became habitual gradually, added itself to his habitual feelings, and at length gave him that wonderful power by which he stands alone, with no equal or second in his own class anywhere. It seated him on one of the two golden thrones of the English Parnassus, with Milton on the other. The one darting himself forth and passing into all the forms of human character and passion, the other attracting all forms and things to himself into the unity of his own grand ideal. Shakespeare becomes all things, yet forever remaining himself, while all things and forms become Milton. Oh, what great men hast thou not produced England, my country, truly indeed, now he quotes Wordsworth, the poem that we had read earlier, one of his sonnets. We must be free or die, who speak the tongue which Shakespeare spake, the faith and morals hold which Milton held. In everything we are sprung of earth's first blood, have titles manifold. Uh, so this, uh, this bears some commentary here. First of all, when he's speaking of Shakespeare and he's saying that he is no mere child of nature, I need to give a little bit of a sense of context here. Shakespeare has been used in the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns, and I refer to that in, once again in my literary theory lectures uh, on the period. In the uh, French Academy, of uh, the Academy Francaise of the uh, late 17th century into the early century, uh, 18th century, there's a debate that is arising over whether uh, who is the greatest, whether it is the modern age or whether it is the ancients. Uh, and we ought to emulate and we can't seek to supersede the greatness of the classical age. And there are defenders on both sides. One of the uh, chief representatives of the modern age is Mr. William Shakespeare. And the claim that arises, and it arises both in France, but more particularly in England, is that Shakespeare has... Uh, superseded and in fact uh, excelled far beyond that of the Greek and Roman uh, poets in his corpus of work. And wherein does his excellence reside? Well, for those who are promoting the modern spirit and the modern age, it lies in Shakespeare's natural genius. And so Shakespeare uh, and Milton himself uh, seems to uh, support this thesis when he refers to Milton in, or to, to Shakespeare in Lycidas with the lines, noble Shakespeare, um, wood and wild, uh, warbling his native wood notes wild. No, noble Shakespeare fancy child warbling his native wood notes wild. Seeing Shakespeare as effectively an uneducated man who nonetheless had a natural sensibility that made him the great poet that he is. In other words, he, uh, was an exemplum of, a, of an untutored uh, original spirit. <coughs> and with that then, of course, he would be the great representative of romanticism itself. Not a, a representative of a tradition, not leaning upon other, other people's work and imitating it and following in their footsteps, but working, as it were, uh, uh, from his own hymn sheet. And this, of course, would be precisely what I said uh, the Romantics themselves sought to do. And so with that, we see in Coleridge's own corpus of work a great interest in Shakespeare and, and lectures on Shakespeare. And Shakespeare, uh, Coleridge's lectures on Shakespeare are fascinating and to some degree the best work that has been written on uh, Shakespeare. Uh, 
and it is to Shakespeare that we can note the uh, claim that where the the genius of Shakespeare lies in his awareness of psychological dynamics, not just what's on stage, but what's happening in the minds of the characters and the souls of the characters. This this gaze on the psyche, which he says is is Shakespeare's unique gift. He has this capacity. And it can't be doubted from my vantage point that Shakespeare has a terrific capacity for characterization. And the reason for that, well, we will come uh, to uh, discuss that uh, a bit later on, but I'm not sure how deeply I'll go into it, so I better say it right now. Co uh, Keats refers to this as Shakespeare's negative capability. And what he means by that is that Shakespeare, just as uh, Coleridge is suggesting here, was capable of presenting characters that were entirely believable and without imposing himself. We have no idea what, what Shakespeare himself thought about almost anything. And, uh, and yet he had this terrific poetic gift of uh, negating his own personality and presenting the character of others in such terms as that we find them entirely credible and they almost leap off uh, the page or in the case of theater off the stage because we think that is a person that I know and he does it with with women and men with with kings and with paupers with the fools and with the uh, great uh, villains of the day and uh, for that reason Shakespeare is without parallel in uh, the letters of uh, mankind perhaps but certainly on the English Parnassus as uh, Coleridge des describes it, Parnassus, by the way, is where the Greek, uh, the Greeks, uh, poet, poetic geniuses were uh, celebrated, and where the muses themselves lived. Uh, and he's juxtaposed uh, to Mr. Milton, who had the opposite power. Uh, the, everything that Milton touched w bore the mark of his personal piety and his. Uh, Puritan character, and that happened irrespective of the poetic form that he chose, whether it was a sonnet, whether it was an elegy, whether it was an eclogue, whether it was a tragedy, or whether it was an epic, you could see uh, it was clear that Milton's stamp of character was impressed on everything, so that everything became Milton, as, as uh, Coleridge presents it, whereas with Shakespeare it was the opposite. Who is Shakespeare? What did he think? Uh, in our day, one of the questions is, was he a Catholic or was he a Protestant? In ages past, it's, was he effectively an atheist? That was the presentation in the early 20th century. He wasn't a, a religious believer at all, and in fact was opposed to it. Um, I think that there's still some that hold to that view, and Harold Bloom would be one of those men, uh, and, and a poet for all ages. But this idea that Shakespeare was a representative of nature, Coleridge uh, disagrees with, and he wants to um, speak to it directly. And so he, once again, he says he's no mere child of nature, no automaton of genius, possessed by the mused, not possessing. Now note the distinctions here. He doesn't, he isn't his own muse. He is uh, possessed by the muse. And remember, the muses are the goddesses that are the offspring of memory. Memory is their mother. And so he first has to know a great corpus of literary works, and he has memorized them. And by slow process, uh, he uh, knows these things inside out and then presents them in his own distinctive form. But first he knows them, these things, and he, uh, in other words, he's a highly learned man. And yet, in some ways, uh, uniquely himself. But look, note how he reflects this. He says, <clears throat> he first studied, deeply meditated, understood minutely, though knowledge became habitual gradually, added itself to his habitual feelings, and at length gave him that wonderful power by which he stands alone with no equal or second in his own class anywhere. Note the process. He first exercises what the ancient world refers to as mimesis. He imitates, he learns, he studies, he follows the example, and then slowly he becomes uh, himself out of that. Now, that, that is a process of education and a process of poetics <coughs> that Coleridge says, says 
um, is true of every good poet. And I am going to contend that for all of their rhetoric, the romantics themselves are all products just like Shakespeare. They are deeply read individuals. There, there's not one of the characters that we're going to look as a great poet here who actually uh, fits their own uh, uh, rhetoric and is totally original and is not really reflecting on the work and the forms of their predecessors, whether it be Shakespeare or Milton or, or, um, or Dante or any of the other writers that they are reflecting upon. So we can see them in the light of the tradition. They can't be understood outside of that. So I just wanted to, to uh, draw your attention to that. Already in 1810, it's clear that, that Coleridge is going directly against the idea of, the, uh, uh, of Shakespeare as a representation of modernity and of a, a natural genius that has nothing to do with the classical tradition. So he's speaking against that. I think that's uh, important to note here. And it seems to me entirely sensible. sensible um, uh, rational. <clears throat> now, I, <clears throat> now I'm going to look at some of his lectures, uh, lectures to the London Philosophical Society. Uh, this is from lecture nine, uh, and uh, it is in 1811 at the end of the year, uh, December uh, 16th. And he says, he, he says this, many scriptural poems have been written with so much of scripture in them that what is not scripture appears to be not true. And like mingling lies with the most sacred revelations. Now, Milton, on the other hand, has taken for his subject that one point of scripture of which we have the mere fact recorded. And upon this, he has most judiciously constructed his whole fable. So of Shakespeare's King Lear, we have little historic evidence to guide or confine us. And the few facts handed down to us and admirably employed by the poet are sufficient while we read to put an end to all doubt as to the credibility of the story. It is idle to say that this or that incident is improbable because history, as far as it goes, tells us that the fact was so and so. Four or five lines in the Bible include the whole that is said of Milton's story. And the poet has called up that poetic faith, that conviction of the mind, which is necessary to make that seem true, which otherwise might have been deemed almost fabulous. Now he's commenting is Mr. Coleridge on Milton's approach to literature and what he in fact does with this. And he is talking about Milton's imagination, which is, uh, I, I won't say it's uh, leaning on only a few verses of scripture. I think he overstates his case. Uh, we can see that it, in some senses, the whole spirit of scripture uh, breathe through, through Milton's uh, work here. But nonetheless, he, the account of Paradise Lost is based on Genesis uh, 3, verses 1 to 8, roughly speaking. <coughs> and, uh, and yet there's also references to the creation of the whole world in uh, Paradise Lost, to the uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, so Genesis uh, one and two, in other words, there's also references to a war in heaven. So that pulls in Revelation 12. And with Revelation 12, in some sense, a commentary on the entirety of the meta narrative of scripture. <clears throat> and then various references to um, lines of scripture throughout the entirety of po Paradise Lost. And of course, the grand themes of Paradise Lost are none, are none other than those that scripture itself paints uh, quite uh, clearly. And Milton follows those contours. So it's not quite accurate to say that he's leaning on a couple of lines. Nonetheless, he, that those are the central uh, portion of scripture. He's not trying to encapsulate the entirety of the scriptural portrait. He is focusing on one uh, particular instance <clears throat> to present his epic subject. I think it's a wonderful extract and quite powerfully and movingly presented. Uh, let me move on, though, uh, to years on and come to the gist of the matter. We're getting closer now. Uh, this is, uh, we're not in, quite yet in the Biographia Literaria. <clears throat> we are in, in the apologetic preface to uh, Fire, Famine, and Slaughter. This is 1815, so two years before the Biographia. And he herein comes to, and it's somewhat of a diversion from 
the subject matter of the rest of this lecture, but he comes to juxtapose two men, uh, the, uh, the Puritan Milton and the Anglican Jeremy Taylor. And again, it's these sort of contrasts between men and the stamp of their mind and the character of their genius, which Coleridge follows the great um, uh, Greek writer, um, well, he's actually a Roman writer, but writing in Greek, Petrarch, not Petrarch, um, uh, Plutarch, sorry. Uh, Plutarch in his parallel lives, he will set uh, on the one side a Greek figure uh, whether it's a poet or a statesman or a philosopher or whatever, and on the other, a Roman, and he will compare and contrast them. Uh, Coleridge follows that example often in his own literary work. We've already seen his favorite mode of comparison, namely Coleridge to Milton, Coleridge to Milton, Shakespeare to Milton, and he will add to that a third element, namely Wordsworth, and he does that in order to speak of the specific character of Mr. Wordsworth. But here he does it in a different way, and he does it with respect to um, their, their churchmanship. Now, Coleridge is an Anglican, and he leans, although he appreciates Milton and regards him as a great genius, he leans more towards the liturgical emphasis of Jeremy Taylor. And I'll just read this, uh, and it will be a little bit of a digression from uh, the rest of the subject matter of his, of his work, but still I wanted to, you to see the, uh, the, the temper of Coleridge's mind here in this extract. He says, if ever two great men might seem during their whole lives to have moved in direct opposition, though neither of them has at any time introduced the name of the other, Milton and Jeremy Taylor were they. The former Milton commenced his career by attacking the church liturgy and all set forms of prayer. The latter, but far more successfully, Coleridge's opinion, by defending both, namely uh, church liturgy and all set forms of prayer. Milton's next work was against the prelacy and the then existing church government, Taylor's in vindication and support of them, Milton became more and more a stern Republican, or rather an advocate for that religious and moral aristocracy, which in his day was called Republicanism, and which even more than royalism itself is the direct antipode of modern Jacobi Jacobinism. Now, this is an interesting comment and uh, will bear scrutiny in two seconds. Let me come to Taylor before I say that. Taylor as more and more skeptical concerning the fitness of men in general for power, became more and more attached to the prerogatives of monarchy. From Calvinism, <clears throat> with a still decreasing respect for fathers, councils, and for church antiquity and other in general, Milton seems to have ended in an indifference, if not a dislike to all forms of ecclesiastic government, and to have retreated wholly into the inward and spiritual church communion of his own spirit with the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Taylor, with a growing reverence for authority, an increasing sense of the insufficiency of the scriptures without the aids of tradition and the consent of authorized interpreters, advanced as far in his approaches, not indeed to popery, but to Roman Catholicism, as a conscientious minister of the English church could well venture. Milton would be and would utter the same to all on all occasions. He would tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Taylor would become all things to all men, if by any means he might benefit any. Hence, he availed himself in his popular writings of opinions and representations which stand alone, often in striking contrast with the doubts and convictions expressed in his more philosophic works. He appears in not too severely to have blamed the management of truth, istum falsitatum dispens dispensativum, authorized and exemplified by almost all the fathers, integrum om, omino, omnio doctoribus e curtis Christiani antistibius esse et dolos uh, versant. I will, I'm not going to bother with the, uh, Itali uh, the uh, Latin that he appears, but he, he appears to uh, not too severely to blame the management of truth uh, exemplified by all the fathers. So he is, in a sense, a defender even of their apparent uh, foibles and failings. 
and such as his reverence for a tradition. Whereas Milton is a firm and always uh, strong representative of the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth and will not tolerate any impurity of doctrine or of conduct, etc. So these two great men. Now in this, he nonetheless sees a sort of a unifying force. And this is what I wanted to draw your attention to, not just the juxtaposition of Milton to Taylor and Coleridge seemingly to favor uh, Taylor as an Anglican and as uh, somebody who reverenced tradition in this sense, a, a true uh, conservative in the Burkean mold and, and gradual reform rather than uh, revolutionary reform. But nonetheless, he says that even that Milton in some ways is even more strongly than Taylor, a, an opponent to modern Jacobinism. Now, Jacobinism is the spirit of the French Revolution, which is a defiance of all authority and all truth for that matter. And it's simply a force that embraces chaos and disorder and anarchy regarding all forms of rule and all forms of fixity as ipso facto uh, perverse and to be uh, deleted, destroyed, overthrown. In other words, Milton, he is saying, uh, supports um, the very things that the Romantics, certainly in the second generation, seem to most adamantly opposed. The idea that there is any goodness in authority, per se, that there is any um, place for uh, an establishment, that there is any uh, good that resides in uh, the forms of human society as they currently are experienced. Milton strongly asserts the truth and nonetheless supports the idea that there are forms of human society and in poetry that have a, uh, a vital power to them. At, likewise, uh, Taylor does, but Milton's, he suggests, is even a stronger support for that. And I, that's my own conviction on this, by the way. But note that what he is doing here is juxtaposing the spirit of the French Revolution to Milton. And the reason I say that this is noteworthy is that we could come into the error, which we certainly see in Marxist uh, scholars and writers and thinkers, and it has become very common in the modern age, to see a continuity between the Republican uh, government of all of Cromwell and the aims and uh, uh, character of the French Revolution. They're both, they both decapitated a king. They both uh, promoted a uh, anti-monarchical spirit. They both sought to uh, purify uh, what they came across. Uh, Coleridge sees a clear and distinct uh, dividing line between Milton and the aims of the Republicans under Cromwell uh, to that of the spirit of the French revolutionaries, which just took a uh, basically a sword to all tradition and sought to recalibrate all of human society. And we saw some representations of that in the work that we looked at. So among other things, the French revolutionaries <coughs> sought to change the calendar and even the week, the seven day week, they sought to set it upon the principle of, of 10 days. Uh, so a revolutionary notion of time in keeping with the writing of a, a French atheist at the time. It failed uh, utterly in the end, and, and Napoleon uh, effectively pulled plug on it after uh, decades of trying. But nonetheless, there was an attempt to totally overthrow all forms of order in the belief that a, a more rational age could do better than the inherited traditions had done. Whereas Milton saw in his uh, Republican government and in his uh, poetic work, the uh, the tradition as the tr the true tradition lying in uh, the forms that were bequeathed to him, and he needed simply to purify the forms. All that said, uh, I think that's a very interesting uh, development and a very interesting contrast. Let's come to the Biographia Literaria, and I'm not going to reflect on the entirety of it by any means. But the, the great work, the Biographia Literaria, which is published in 1817, uh, but is written somewhere in 1815, 16, thereabouts, <coughs> uh, he notes that, uh, right in, at the outset in chapter one, he says, uh, the authority of Milton and Shakespeare, this is in a note, uh, one of his many footnotes, if you read the biography, it's, there are more footnotes than there are actual 
uh, at times it seems like text. He says, the authority of Milton and Shakespeare may be usefully pointed out to young authors. In the Comus, which is Milton's work um, that's devoted to uh, chastity, and other early poems of Milton, there is a superfluity of double epithets. While in the Paradise Lost, we find very few. In the Paradise Regained, scarce any. The same remark holds almost equally true to the Love's Labor's Lost. Now he's reflecting on Shakespeare. Romeo and Juliet, Venus and Adonis, and Lucrece, compared with the Lear, Macbeth, Othello, and Hamlet of our great dramatist. And he's not reflecting on whether Shakespeare is a Catholic here. Uh, some have said in the early poetry of, of Shakespeare, they find uh, the greatest evidence of Shakespeare's Catholicism. Uh, Coleridge is, has no interest in that. What he's interested in is his linguistic technique. Early on, he uses double epithets, just as Milton does. Later on, almost none. And in his greatest works, almost none. Uh, the rule for the administration of double epithets seems to be this. Either that they should be already denizens of our language. So don't use them unless they're already there in the language, such as blood-stained, terror-stricken, self-applauding. Or when a new epithet or one found in books only is hazarded, that it at least be one word, not two words made one by mere virtue of the printer's hyphen, a language which, like the English, is almost without cases, is indeed in its very genius unfitted for compounds. Don't make it like German, even though it has a Germanic root. Do not follow the German pattern of double epithets or triple and adding words to one another and creating a new word, which is unclear to anyone but the author. But it particularly doesn't work, it, it isn't suitable for English. He says, if a writer, <clears throat> every time a compounded N word suggests itself to him, would seek for some other mode of expressing the same sense, the chances are always greatly in favor of his finding a better word. <clears throat> anyway, just a reflection. Now, what you can see in this is how deeply uh, Coleridge has read these two authors and reflected on their poetic practices. He's now even commenting on their, not only their use of language, but the, the, the uh, transformation of their use in language between their early years and their later years. And now he's making a general commentary on how we ought to use language uh, if we seek to do so well. And at the same time, and this is a later extract, a few pages on, he says, at the same time that we were studying the Greek tragic poets, he's referring to himself here, Coleridge, he made us read Shakespeare and Milton as lessons, his uh, teacher in grammar school. And they were the lessons too, which required most time and trouble to bring up so as to escape his censure. I learnt from him that poetry, even that of the loftiest and seemingly that of the wildest odes, had a logic of its own, as severe as that of science, and more difficult, because more subtle, more complex, and dependent on more, and more fugitive causes. In the truly great poets, he would say, there is a reason assignable, not only for every word, but for the position of every word. And this is my own contention as well. In the, in the great poets, I'm not talking about in our language, let alone that of inferior poets. It is not simply the uh, choice of words, the diction, but the very syntax which uh, the poets have mastered. And so we could not move a word around without a loss of some uh, very subtle connection and it would diminish the power of the verse. Now, Coleridge is going to go on to say about even the great poets, not everything in the great poets is great. <clears throat> but there are purple passages that are nonetheless so. <clears throat> um, let me move on with this and uh, not belabor it too much and get closer to the uh, discussion, which is what I wanted to focus on, which is this definition of the imagination. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> in, in chapter four of the Biographia, <clears throat> he... Uh, makes one of these famous oppositions. And the opposition that he creates here is between the two poets, uh, Milton on the one hand and Cowley on the other. The one uh, is a representation of the imagination. The other is a representation of a faculty that he's going to call the fancy. So here it, here it goes. 
Milton had a highly imaginative, Cowley a very fanciful mind. If, therefore, I should succeed in establishing the actual existence of two faculties generally different, the nomenclature would be at once determined. To the faculty by which I, char I had characterized Milton, we should confine the term imagination, while the other would be contradistinguished as fancy. Now, were it once fully ascertained that this division is no less grounded in nature than that of delirium from mania, or Otway's lutes, lobsters, seas of milk, and ships of amber from Shakespeare's, what, have his daughters brought him to this pass? Or from preceding apostrophe to the elements, the theory of the fine arts and of poetry in particular could not, I thought, but derive some additional and important light. It would in its immediate effects furnish a torch of guidance to the philosophical critic and ultimately to the poet himself. In energetic minds, truth soon changes by domestication into power and from directing in the discrimination and appraisal of the product becomes influensive in the production. To admire on principle is the only way to imitate without loss of originality. Now note that. To admire on principle is the only way to imitate without loss of originality. So now he is more closely scrutinizing what he means by the imagination. And it's fascinating to me that in the biographia, it is not Shakespeare that he draws into his gaze as the primary representative of the imagination, but it is Milton. And why Milton? Well, it's precisely for the reasons that we are already articulated. Milton is the representative of English character and spirit because it most closely approximates that of Christian truth. That's the reason why. So the imagination in Coleridge's rendering cannot be separated from its rooting in scripture and in God's own creative activity that is represented in scripture. And that's not to diminish Mr. Shakespeare in any way, but it, it is to say that Coleridge's definition of the imagination must be linked with men in a way that it has not been acknowledged, but which this course to some degree reflects upon. And in, uh, in presenting Milton in such a central way in his work, he is to some degree questioning the the uh, departures from Milton, which we will find are characteristic of many of certainly the secondary uh, romantic poets that will occupy us on the second half of the course, namely uh, Shelley and, uh, and Byron and Keats. They depart from this, uh, this template that uh, distinguishes Milton. And, and so their, their notion of the imagination is at odds with his insofar as they do so. Let me move on. <clears throat> uh, in chapter uh, th 13, uh, the epigraph, he is, uh, we're getting close to the centerpiece of the Biographia Literaria. By the way, the Biographia is written, written in two phases. There's uh, uh, book one and book two, uh, two parts rather, part one, part two. Uh, part one concludes with his famous definition of the imagination in chapter 13. The primary, the secondary, and the fancy. I'll read it in a second. And then part two departs and talks about um, primarily reflecting on Wordsworth. So he builds up to the imagination and his definition of the imagination in chapter 13. And then in the second half of the Biographia Literaria, he then talks about the romantic enterprise and how Wordsworth in some sense fits that notion and how he does not. But he clearly sees a unity there in his understanding of the imagination. What does he say in the epigraph of chapter 13? Well, it's on the imagination or the SM plastic power. Now this is Coleridge's own word and it refers to the power of fusing into one. That's, it, it's a unifying power. Here it is. It's a quotation from Paradise Lost. Oh, Adam. One Almighty is, from whom all things proceed, and up to him return, if not depraved from good, created all such to perfection, one first nature, all, endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live of life, but more refined, more spirituous and pure, 
as nearer to him placed or nearer tending, each in their several active spheres assigned, till body up to spirit work in bounds proportion to each kind. So from the root springs lighter the green stalk, from thence the leaves more airy, last the bright consummate flower spirits odorous breathes. Flowers and their fruit, man's nourishment, by gradual scale sublimed, to vital spirits aspire, to animal, to intellectual, give both life and sense, fancy and understanding, whence the soul reason receives, and reason is her being discursive or intuitive. Paradise Lost, Book 5, lines 469 to 488, if you want to go back and look at his quotation there. So note that in his epigraph, right before he comes to his own definition in a very odd and typically Coleridgean way, as be he, somebody comes in and interrupts him and says, get on with it, that sort of thing. And then he just lays it out there, what he's been circling around for ages. He finally gets to this definition. He does it by just immediately preceding this to a discussion of how this relates to God's own character and spirit by quoting Paradise Lost. And the angel explaining uh, to Adam exactly how the uh, how everything relates to God, and he does it in quasi Neoplatonic terms, the the ladder of being, uh, and the ladder of being with degrees and kinds, um, and uh, speaks of the them as as a, an organic sort of entity, and the how the um, just like a uh, a, a tree that has roots and a stalk and leaves and then flowers or, or a plant. Uh, in the similarly way that, that he talks about the great chain of being here <clears throat> and how it gives rise to ultimately to spiritual and intellectual and even reason as the flower of all of these things and in various forms there. In the same way, he's going to describe man's use of uh, the imagination in similar sorts of terms. In other words, there's an organic unity to it. It's not wholly, uh, uh, although they may be distinct powers, they're not separate powers. So this exemplastic power of the imagination to unify things in a rational form, and both words are important. It's rational and it has a form. What's the definition then? Well, the definition, <clears throat> if you haven't got it in front of you, I'll just read it and then comment and then I'll conclude with this. He says, the imagination then, I consider either as primary or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception. And as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. The secondary imagination I consider as an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of its agency and differing only in degree and in the mode of its operation. And what is the mode? It dissolves, diffuses, dissipates in order to recreate or where this process is rendered impossible, yet still at all events, it struggles to idealize and to unify. It is essentially vital, even as all objects, as objects are essentially fixed and dead. Fancy, on the contrary, has no other counters to play with but fixities and definites. The fancy is indeed no other than a mode of memory, emancipated from the order of time and space, which it is blended with and modified by that empirical phenomenon of the will which we express by the word choice. But equally with the ordinary memory, the fancy must receive all its materials ready-made from the law of association. So fancy is a form of memory, and it's, it's, it's not quite memory, but it's, it's like memory, and it receives these simply through the law of association, uh, analog, etc., which he already referred to back in 1804, as we saw uh, early on at the outset, the first thing I quoted. But the imagination, note that he has a twofold definition of the imagination, and one builds on the other, because he says the secondary is an echo of the former. And then it, it distinguishes it from it. And what, how does it distinguish it? It di di distinguishes it, it itself in the, uh, in, in the degree. It's identical in kind. 
in other words, it's tied into <coughs> uh, the repetition uh, of what God has done. It's a connection. It's a strong connection. Just as Milton has himself in his poetic corpus focused upon Christian truth as the central pure focus of his literary work and and represented it in various forms, but all of them bore the mark of Milton's Puritan mind. In the same way, he is going to define the imagination in this Christian form. And I, I, I don't think it could be much more clear, although the critics have not seen it in this way. I see it this way. And I think uh, Coleridge is clear on it, and he connects it strongly with Milton. Uh, and not with Shakespeare, although he thinks it's not that Shakespeare is... Uh, not a great poet. He is one of the two figures on the English Parnassus. But nonetheless, it's Milton that he focuses on, and it's precisely because of Milton's Christian uh, truth and his focus upon it. The imagination then, primary or secondary? What is the primary? Well, it's the living power and the prime agent of all human perception. Now, the, these terms, power and agent, are capitalized as sorts of abstractions, but the idea of agency refer is a, a term that we attribute to, to beings, uh, entities, persons. Here it's the agent of all human perception. How is it that we perceive things? He's almost using uh, the language here of the uh, Bishop Barclay, that with the reason that we see things as we do is because they exist in the mind of God. And the reason we are... Uh, uh, perceiving them uh, and not acknowledging them is because we can't think otherwise than in accordance with the uh, template in which uh, God has created them and in which we receive them because we are made in, in Imago Dei. We can't think outside of the tram lines in which God has created thought to operate. And so, in, that's what he means there in the primary. And he says that it's a repetition then in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am that famous phrase in which uh, God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush, when Moses asks who God is and who shall I say sent me to do what you're calling me to do, namely to lead the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am that I am. A self-referential term to some degree, it's not even an answer to the question, or it's, a, it's an oblique answer to the question. It, he doesn't give a name per se. He says that he is the fount of being, but to some degree, it's also, I, I will be what I will be. It's often rendered in. In other words, you will see who I am by what I do. And this reflects on what I've described in my uh, work in the Bible as literature, this word davar in Hebrew, which is that God, the davar means both word and action. So the word of God, who's Jesus Christ, also acts and in his action, reveals God's character in his, not only in his person, Jesus, the word of God, but also in his speech. There's a creative power in this and is there's a revelation in this. And when we use words, we are repeating God's creative power. And when we echo God's truth, of course, we are acting imaginatively by virtue of that. Now, the primary imagination is doing precisely that. And in that sense, anyone who, uh, repeats Christian truth, I think, is using the primary imagination. But the poet, in addition, uses the secondary ima imagination. And this is the distinctively uh, poetic power, which I think uh, we, when we come to think of artistic uh, renderings, like what is, what is it specifically that the poets do, they use the secondary imagination. We all use the primary imagination insofar as we echo Christian truth. And Note that the secondary cannot depart from that and still be imaginative on, on Coleridge's rendering. And this is, I think, where he makes his stamp very much against the spirit of romanticism, which de departs wholly from Christian truth in some ways. Once again, the secondary imagination I consider as an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of its agency. In the kind of its agency, it's not distinguish in any way other than in the degree with which it is something different, a degree of the willfulness and in the mode of its operation. Well, what's the mode? Well, it, it, it breaks things apart. It dissolves, diffuses, dissipates, 
But the reason it does so is for the as in plastic purposes that he suggested earlier to draw them, draw them back together into a unity. And he says that when the process is impossible, still at all events, it struggles to idealize and to unify. So the power of the imagination is a one that creates form and not simply chaos, not just formlessness. Now this, I think, um, bears a reflection on how we've seen Coleridge's own poetic corpus operate, because remember he writes fragments that are not unified uh, per se. Uh, we might have to talk about that some other times. But I think I've said sufficient here to give you a sense of how I think Coleridge's imagination is reflecting also on Milton, but in a way which is not a not breaking with the Miltonic tradition is in some sense seeing it, it itself uh, in continuity with it. But with that is to some degree speaking against uh, the romantic movement and modernity, which is predicated on the truths of the romantic movement and sees itself as this organic link with that. I think Coleridge is the great dissenter amongst the romantics and not as the critical tradition has presented him as the great representative of the romantics. And with that, I conclude and I will speak to you next time and we will move on to William Blake and something rather different. I'll see you then.